Hello, and welcome to this video, which will debrief the second exam uh, for Physics 132 for the fall 2020 semester. So just sort of to remind you, the purpose of these videos is to really go through all the exam questions and explicitly connect each question to what we did in class. If at the end of this video, you still don't see the connections, please, please let me know as you're missing something key about the discipline of physics. So first things first, fairness on the exam. This is one of the questions from the post-exam reflection poll. And we can see that 86.4% of you thought that the exam was either fair or mostly fair, which I consider to be a good thing. Also think from the exam reflection, uh, post-exam reflection poll, I ask, you know, what y'all think are the easiest and the hardest problems? And a couple interesting things in here. Uh, as far as the easiest problems go, we thought apparently that problems three, six, and seven were the easiest problems, and five, nine, and ten were apparently the most challenging for most people. Uh, problem one was a little interesting. Uh, it was both the easiest and the hardest, apparently, depending upon who you were. So there was quite some discrepancy on that first problem. So we'll pay particular attention to these problems as we go forward. So let's begin going through the exam, uh, starting with that question one that people thought was both easy and hard. Uh, so this was about the fish and the bird. So the procedure here was for each ray to, to draw normal. And since I'm going from air to water, the light will bend toward the normal, like so. And then if we trace those rays backwards, uh, the result is a virtual image further from the water surface than the bird actually is. So the bird appears to be a little bit further from the water surface than it actually is. This is basically uh, what we did on the second day of unit two, slides 14 to 15 with the penny and the Cairo syrup, but upside down. So take this process and run it backwards and you get this problem. Moving on to question two, which was about our proteins in our uh, sort of gel electrophoresis setups. Uh, which protein experiences the largest electric field? The one that's in vacuum, because the polarization of the gel will always result in a reduction of the electric field between the plates. This was seen on unit four, uh, unit three, day four, slide nine. We had this basically this exact question. Now comparing only uh, setups A and B for which proton protein experiences the larger electric field. The two are the same because the field is established by the plates alone and has nothing to do with the protein. So this was unit three, day four, slides 10, uh, and day five, slide 11. So we had, again, basically this exact same question. Uh, similarly, with regards to the electric force, uh, the protein in setup B will experience the larger force because it has a larger charge. Since F equals QE, the larger the uh, charge for the same electric field, the larger the force. And then thinking about the acceleration, you had to think about the electric forces in relationship to their masses and do an F equals MA. And while setup B has a force, an electric force that's four times as large, the uh, mass is eight times as large, which means the acceleration of B will actually be half that the acceleration of A. So partial credit was in fact given for these problems. You know, if, if you got any one of them, you did get partial credit. Uh, moving on to question number three was about a pinhole and asking what you could ascertain from the pinhole uh, or the source of light just based upon the picture. And you could determine that the source of light must be the shape that you see on the screen. So there were some variations on this problem, but whatever shape was on the screen, that must be the shape of the light source. Uh, you can't tell anything about the pinhole. Uh, the pinhole is going to be uh, regardless of the pinhole shape, you will get the shape of the light source. Um, this was done on unit two, day three, slide nine, where we sort of made the image from a series of little circles. And you can see that that would work just as well if 
the pinhole was a series of little squares, it would work just fine. In fact, we had a very similar version uh, to this on unit two, day three, slide 21. Uh, this was, again, one of the easier problems, according to most people. Uh, partial credit was given here, 50% for each correct answer and minus 25% for each incorrect answer. Uh, so folks just don't get full credit for just checking all of them, which is if I had just gone 50% for each, you could have gotten full credit just by checking all of them. Uh, Moodle doesn't allow for more intelligent ways of doing things. So this was the uh, solution. So it's plus 50 for each correct and minus 25 for each incorrect. Uh, a fun note about problem three is it is about 2,300 years old. Um, so here is a page from Aristotle's Problems, book 15, question six, which there's some uncertainty on exactly when this was put together, but some estimates are about third century BCE, uh, the time of Aristotle himself. And you can see here that uh, question six is exactly why does the sun leave round uh, images when shown through square wicker? The reason is is because the sun is round. So that's the motivation. I think it's kind of cool that this question is about 2,300 years old. Uh, his answer, by the way, Aristotle's answer is wrong, but the question is still there. Uh, question four was our uh, scanning electron microscope problem. Um, and if the electron is bending toward the normal, it must be moving slower in the condenser lens than relative to before it. Uh, this was discussed on unit two, day one. And in particular, you were asked to basically fill this out exactly in the first bullet of the next time problem from day one to day two. So you can see if light goes into a medium where it travels slower than where it started, it will bend uh, toward the normal in that first bullet there. Uh, in order for the uh, speed to slow down, the wavelength must go up. This is P equals H over lambda. If V goes down, then P goes down, which means the wavelength must go up. And you see that here on unit one, day five, slide 16. Uh, we did something where we ranked the waves of different particles based upon their wavelength, we rank their speed. So that's sort of what should have maybe led you into this particular direction. Uh, if I want the electron to go slower, then I want the kinetic energy to go down, which means I need the potential energy to go up. Uh, that part's just you know basic 131 conservation of energy type stuff. Uh, but we also applied it to electrons directly on unit one, day nine, slides 10 through 14. And then if I want the potential energy to go up, then for an electron, I need the potential to go down because U equals QV. So if I want uh, U to go up, I need V to go down so that the negative makes uh, the potential energy go up. And then this was done on unit three, uh, day six, slide eight. We had a problem that was exceedingly similar to this. All right. Uh, question five was one of the harder problems on the exam. Uh, no doubt about it there. You had this uh, arrangement of charges and you were asked to calculate the uh, potential energy in joules of the one in the lower left. And so the way to approach this was begin by, by calculating the potential at the point in the lower left from the other two charges. Here you can see I've called them minus Q top and minus Q right to get the potential at the location of the positive charge. Uh, we know the formula for potential, one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R. In this case, R is D, that's the distance between the uh, charges. So that simplifies down because it's just the same thing twice. And then once you've got the potential, you can convert that to potential energy with QV. So you would use the uh, charge of the particle in the lower left times the potential you'd already calculated to determine the potential energy. 
Uh, as an example, for these particular numbers, uh, the, this particular problem has a Q of 6.6 .6 nanocoulombs and a D of 2.02 meters. Uh, if I put those numbers in, you see I get a potential of minus 58.758 volts. And then multiplying that by another 6.6 .6 nanocoulombs, I get a potential energy of minus 3.87 times 10 to the minus 7 joules. Uh, this was days six and seven, basically, of unit three was all about calculating uh, potentials and potential energies of various configurations of point charges. Partial credit was given. Uh, while it does expressly ask for the answer in joules, I accepted it if you gave a number that was correct in electron volts. I gave full credit for that. Um, if your number was voltage. If you only calculated the voltage and not the potential energy, only the potential, I gave you two points out of the four. Uh, in fact, and if you got the sign at all, that was worth one point. So if your answer was negative, you got a point. Um, and also, uh, I was lenient if you made a mistake with orders of powers of 10, that sort of thing. You were able to get partial credit there as well. Uh, question six was recommended as one of the easier problems on the exam. This was the infinite infant eyeball, not infinite, infant. Uh, the step here is to begin with one over I, one over O, one over F. And then you know that the image position must be on the retina. In order for us to see, the image has to be on the retina. This is something we discussed quite a bit in class. And uh, in this particular problem, uh, the random number was an infant eye size of 15.88 millimeters. Uh, the focal length was given in the problem is 15.13 millimeters. Solving it out, you get an object distance of 320.35 millimeters. And so that is the minimum distance that an infant can see. Uh, so we actually solved uh, hyperopia as one of our uh, next time problems, it was done in preparation for correcting it. I asked you to, to figure out what the uh, closest distance someone with hyperopia uh, can see, and, and it was the exact same procedure. Uh, there were a couple of things in the comment about people asking, like, I don't think that's right. I've heard that infants are nearsighted, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's a very common thing. I know I was told that when my daughter was born, that infants are nearsighted. And when I was starting to put this problem together, I was writing a problem where you were going to calculate the furthest possible distance. But uh, while putting this problem together, I found this paper on early refractive development in humans in the survey of ophthalmology from 1995, which clearly indicates that uh, low levels of hyperopia are in fact uh, the norm in infant populations. So in newborn infants are actually farsighted. Uh, their peak acuity, however, uh, occurs at a distance of about eight to 10 inches. So even though they're farsighted, their best vision is at about eight to 10 inches um, because acuity involves not just farsighted and nearsightedness, it, it's a that plus several other factors. And so a newborn baby's uh, peak acuity is about eight to 10 inches, which you will notice is about the breast to face distance, which for a newborn baby is the only distance that actually matters. So, so this is why you will often hear the phrase that newborns are nearsighted is because their peak acuity is at eight to 10 inches. Uh, question seven was also identified as one of the easier problems. You were just uh, supposed to determine the direction of the electric field. Uh, so very similar to this problem we did in class. So you have the uh, electric field from the charge in the upper left pointing toward it, the electric field from the charge in the lower right pointing toward it, and the electric field from the charge in the lower left pointing toward it. Add them all up and you get this electric field that points thus. And like I said, this was very similar to a problem we did on unit three, day three, slide three. Question eight was about an object at the center of a concave spherical mirror. And basically you were supposed to figure out where the image is. So if I draw my three rays, 
in parallel out through the focal point in through the focal point out parallel and then in using the center and straight back through it kind of like that you'll notice that they in fact all intersect right back at the center itself uh, you could also have done this via calculation, starting with 1 over i, 1 over o, 1 over f. In this case, the object distance is 2f. And if you put that in and solve it out, you find out that the image is this distance is the same as the object distance 2f. Um, so here's a cool video of that. If I play this video out, you can see what looks very much to be a light bulb sitting on top of this uh, socket. But in fact, there is no light bulb at that location whatsoever. What is going on is you can see here, now there, there is no light bulb there, it just appears to be there. What actually is happening is immediately underneath this socket, you have a light bulb, pardon the slightly unsteady camera work. You have a light bulb underneath and a concave spherical mirror. And so you are getting an image of a bulb underneath exactly at the same spot. So it is exactly the problem uh, you just solved. Okay. Uh, question number nine was also uh, suggested as being one of the more challenging questions on the exam. This one's a little bit uh, trickier. So what's going to happen is that little metal ball is going to uh, polarize. The electrons within it are going to be repelled from the Van de Graaff, leaving a slight excess of positive charge on the near side, which will result in the uh, thing being attracted to the Van de Graaff. Ultimately, it will hit the Van de Graaff itself, pick up a negative charge from the Van de Graaff, and be repelled from the Van de Graaff and therefore attracted to the ground plate. Uh, because once it's negatively charged, electrons will flee the ground plate, resulting in a net positive charge here, resulting in an attraction. So to summarize, the neutral ball is initially attracted to the Van de Graaff. It hits the Van de Graaff and picks up a negative charge and then is repelled from the Van de Graaff and attracted to the plate. This is very similar to the soap bubble demonstration that we saw in class. Uh, you can also see an example of this precise setup here. So here you've got, instead of a Van de Graaff, we've got a uh, negatively charged plate being charged up by this thing called the Vimhurst machine behind. That's not important, but here's a negatively charged plate. And then this plate is connected to ground. And when we do it, we see that ultimately we actually get a chiming effect. So the ball is attracted to the negatively charged plate. Once it hits the negatively charged plate, it picks up a negative charge and is repelled. And, and not just repelled from this plate, but actively attracted to the grounded plate, runs across, hits the grounded plate, and then this is beyond the scope of the question. That negative charge leaves through the ground wire to the ground, returning us back to the initial neutral ball configuration and the cycle repeats, which is how we get this chiming effect that we see here. All right. So question 10 was also one of the harder questions. This is kind of expected. It was the long answer. It was kind of meant to be. Uh, so here is the setup you were looking at. So let's kind of go through the process. First, you draw your ray diagrams. Uh, I'm going to do the ray through the center first because that's kind of the freebie. Then we do in parallel and out through the focal point. We got to make sure to use the focal point of the converging lens here. And then I have to use the other focal point. So this one over here. So come in as if I'm coming from that focal point and out parallel. 
these rays don't actually converge anywhere. And so we trace them all back. And the result is an image, a virtual erect image uh, that's actually at the focal point of the converging lens. Then we use this image as the object for our diverging lens and repeat the process. So like I said, the image is virtual erect and has a absolute value of magnification that is greater than one because the image is greater than the object, eh, bigger than the object. And then we proceed, as I said, where this is the object for our second lens. So straight through the center, that's always the freebie. In parallel, out using the focal point, since this is a diverging lens, we want to use this focal point here to the left of the lens. So something like that. And then we need to use the focal point we haven't used yet. So we come in as though we were aiming for that focal point and out parallel. Once again, the rays do not converge anywhere. And so we do our usual trick of tracing the rays backwards. And the result is an image uh, here, about three centimeters to the left of the diverging lens. Uh, the image is virtual, erect, and has an absolute value of magnification less than one. Uh, to solve it out mathematically, we begin with 1 over i, 1 over o, 1 over f. Uh, for the first lens, the object distance we can see here is 3. The focal length is plus 6 because it's a converging lens. And when you solve it out, the result is negative 6. So the image distance is negative, meaning it is 6 centimeters on the incoming side of the lens, just like for our farsighted glasses prescription we did in class. In fact, exactly the same. Then we go ahead and use that as our object for the second lens. Uh, how far is this object from this lens? It is 6 plus 6, which means it is 12. And it's a positive 12 because the image is on the incoming side of this diverging lens. So now we can go and apply 1 over i, 1 over o, 1 over f again. Uh, in this case, the focal length is 4, but it must be negative because this is a diverging lens solve it out and you get a minus three centimeters. So that tells us that our image is three centimeters to the left of the diverging lens, okay? So this distance here is three. So how was this problem graded? Uh, so for the diagram, rays were half a point each, um, which you'll notice adds up to three total, six rays, half point each gives you three. Uh, one point for tracing back, which you had to do twice, so half a point each time. And then one point for using the ob the image from the first object as the the image from the first lens as the object for the second. And you could have gotten this point by even saying a sentence along the lines of, if I could get the image from the first lens, which I don't know how to do, I would then use it as the object for my second. Uh, characterization was a third of a point each uh, to get the two points, um, and we round it. So a third rounds 2.4 and two thirds rounds 2.7, okay? Uh, calculating pretty much broke down like this, and you will notice that this only adds to nine and a half instead of the promised 11. Uh, newsflash, I can't do arithmetic. We've known that all semester. Um, so I tried a couple of different things to think about, you know, what was the most beneficial solution to y'all for my mistake? And here's what I've come up with. I uh, gave one point to everyone on this problem for my screw up and then scaled to 11 out of nine and a half. So I added the point and then multiplied by 11 over 9.5. This resulted in the highest exam average of, of several different things that I've tried. So. Your, your, my screw up is, is your benefit. Um, so that's, that's the result. And the highest grade on this problem is actually now a 12.158 out of 11. So if you did well on this, congrats. Uh, one last thing I will say is for the calculating, there were some people who, who didn't go and calculate it, calculate it, calculate the distance and just measured it instead. Um, that was fine as long as you were right to within 10%. So if your diagram was good enough, that that worked for us. So hope this clarifies the second exam and have a good rest of the semester.